Do not make heroes out of villains just because they are the opposite side of the American empire which you so vehemently oppose. Sometimes the enemy of your enemy is a piece of shit. Hey, Ben, it's uh, Jared from Downingtown, PA. Hey, Jared, how's it going, man? I, pretty good. I want to just comment a little bit about your debate last week between you and Nick on uh, Syria. Oh, man, I should have held and, your call because I'm getting ready to do an entire segment on it. But maybe, maybe you can introduce us to that segment. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, think, I think Nick was pretty spot on about Syria mm -hmm. because you left out. In your debate, you left out a lot of things, like you never covered the CIA destabilizing uh, the Syrian people during the beginning of the Arab Spring uprising, which, which has been confirmed that they were doing, because it wasn't enough of a majority of the population to oppose Assad, so they started to have to get it to, to destabilize it and then bring in uh, foreign uh, fighters from places like Syria and Qatar to, uh, to prop up the so-called rebels. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that if we were, that the, the, the only way we could probably have any peace in Syria is if we just stop sending arms there. Everybody just have a total embargo set up on Syria, like any country. Period. Mm -hmm. So if you were like to send in on, there would be like a, a UN um, report that would sanction your country if you did that. And um, I also don't agree that if you're if you're somehow not in favor of overthrowing Assad, you're somehow pro-Russian or something along that line. Because even because when Russia started bombing Syria, I opposed that just as much as I did the U.S. bombing Syria. So it's, it's kind of... Well, to be sure, I, I, want, I, I want to make sure... I don't, want, I don't want that to hang out in the air. Now, I never made the argument that... I never reduced the argument down to if you are pro-Assad, you're pro-Russia. I mean, I, there is, there are some, a lot of nuances to, there's a lot of connections to make that, uh, argument, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I think like there's a lot of false equivalency though, when it comes to Assad, like he's this like really awful, I mean, yeah, okay. There's all dictatorships around the world and they all do things, but we have to understand Assad did not attack the United States. Assad has never once threatened us in any way, shape, or form. The reason we are doing this is so we can destabilize Syria so um, Israel doesn't have any threat on its border, and so I, we can also take out Iran's proxy with Syria which is what Hillary Clinton's plan is, to take out Iran and then go into, I mean, take out Syria and then go into Iran, which, um, who was the general? There was, a, there was a general running in the Democratic primary who laid all this out, that after 9-11, we were going to invade, like, uh, a couple dozen countries, and we've already invaded, like, uh, let's see, we took out Libya, we took out Iraq, we took, were trying to take out Syria, mm -hmm. we took out Yemen. And uh, so, yeah, the, the whole plan is to take out Syria and then go into Iraq, which is what Hillary is going to do as president. I can almost, I can almost guarantee you that's what she's going to do. That Just she's like going to go into Ukraine, Iran. Where she's, yes, and in, in Ukraine as well, where she is funding the uh, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist there so we can have a, another... So Wait, and she's funding the, well. the neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Is yes, that, did yes, I hear you right? There has been documented case. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave There's you on, I want to leave, I want to leave you on the line. I, I want you to leave on the line. I want to leave you on the line because I want you to serve as a proxy for everyone who disagrees with me on, uh, on Syria. Is that okay? Okay. All right. 
Um, let me just do one thing. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. One, let me make let me make it clear to my audience and to everyone. Um, when I'm for something, I I don't equivocate. I come out for it. I'm like, this is what I believe in. This is what it should be. Not once have I ever said we should intervene in in uh, in in Syria. Now you go back and look at the tapes. What I will do is I will play the hell out of a devil's advocate. I will argue, especially when I see flaws in arguments that are being made by people I like and people I respect. I will argue the hell out of the other side just to just to expose those flaws. But not once have I said that we should institute a no fly zone or that that I'm in favor of instituting a no fly zone or that I'm in favor of American interventionism. Um, what I have said is that unless America intervenes on that level, I, there is really no tilting of the power structure there right now except for uh, the balance of power, the, 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 the stalemate, except for what you just presented and what the Green Party presents and what Nick mentioned, which is ostensibly to, um, actually, let me take ostensibly out. Your suggestion is to dry up the arms. My argument about drying up the arms is still the same. We can't, one, we cannot enforce an arms embargo on Syria without force. America, I mean, just the idea of blocking any other nation from sending arms to that region is going to require interventionism. So you, it's like you take one interventionism off the table in favor of another one. There's there. I mean, how would we stop? How will we stop some other actor from going in and supplying arms because there is a demand for arms? And if there's one market, we all should be able to agree will be served in this global world i just say in the world it's the arms market like that's a supply that will always be met and i just don't reasonably see how simply saying to dry up the arms would actually be accomplished without some huge intervention um by the un or by america but it's got to be enforced and you cannot enforce something like that without force itself so to me, that's, that's kind of like, that, that's really not a solution. It sounds good. It's the more, and I've, I've said this so many times, it's the moral thing to do. It is the right thing to do to stop sending arms to the entire region for the love of God. But that is not the solution to the question that's at hand. How do you end the war in Syria? It, that, that, that is the long-term solution of how do you end wars in general. <laughs> but that's not the immediate solution. And uh, so before I go forward, I want you to respond to that. Respond to that on behalf of everyone who uh, who disagrees with me. Well, the U.S. doesn't want to end the war in Syria. That implies we do. I mean, we don't want to overthrow Assad, but at the same time, we want to keep ISIS in check so we can, you know, just have it like as a little wind-up doll. So every time... You know, it looks like ISIS is being defeated. They can just wind it up again and then just have it go out and in, uh, unleash it in Le Libya or Afghanistan or Yemen or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know where you're getting the idea that the U.S. wants to stop any of this stuff. The U.S. is the one who started all this. Okay, I so mean, here's my other – Here, let me jump in there because here's where I totally disagree with, uh, with all of you. This, this leftist critique of America – which I probably 85% to 90% co-sign with. But what it does is it reduces every situation globally down to being about America. There was a revolution that started, and you, I mean, maybe revolution is too harsh of a word, but there were protests of hundreds of thousands of people who were, who were pro-democracy, who were opposing the Assad regime. The, and, and here's something I didn't do, and I want to give credit to uh, one of my listeners who, who called me on it. Nick helped presenting this, this thought that, the, uh, that Assad was democratically elected and accepted by his people. That's historically inaccurate. Assad, first of all, he received the, the regime from his father who obtained it through a military coup. And from 1971 to 2000, he served as the president of Syria through brute force and then handed it down to his son. Elections in 2000 and 2007, the only opposition came from his own party, from the Ba'athist party. 
right? So there was no free and fair elections in Syria. He just simply had, much like China in many regards. It's like you're running against your own party. You're running against yourself. So this idea that they had democracy in Syria was something that was forwarded last week that I didn't call out, and it's absolutely ahistorical. It's, it's not accurate. But, but that's, that's kind of like a, a finer detail. But we reduce, we reduce this entire conflict in Syria to being about America when in actuality there are people over there who rebelled on their own, on their own accord, on their own wishes because they wanted something different. They saw what happened in Tunisia, and this is going to be a horrible use of words, but it spread like wildfire through the region and the Arab Spring, people saw that. And by the time it got to Syria, Assad said, hell no, and he crushed it. But, and actually, let me, let me choose my words better. Before he crushed it, he, he brutally tried to crush it. And by his overreaction, by his, 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 his just overwhelming use of force against protesters, that fueled the revolution even more. And then he crushed it with like with with troops, with, the, you know, it really escalated. It started in Syria. It escalated by Syria. Now, is America clean in this? No, America's never clean in anything. Let's be let's be sure about that. Right. Yes, there were some operatives on the ground involved, but this started. There are people who are there still who are standing on the original cause of the rebellion back in the Arab Spring. This does not mean that the rebel forces that are fighting are all pro-democracy. Some of the rebel forces that are fighting are just as nefarious as the Assad regime, which is why America hasn't found any rebels that we can, you know, comfortably give, you know, supply to the point where we help them win. Right. Because there is it's really become a cluster F of competing forces there. But to be sure, this reduction of the entire region to being about America's imperialistic desires really erases the reality of two things. One, this started in Syria as a result of a couple of factors, one of those factors being the, um, the Arab Spring. And then two, I don't care how we cut it. Whether or not we think America is evil or noble, there is an existing humanitarian crisis in Syria. Whether America gets involved for humanitarian reasons, which we rarely do, that's besides the point. But what I've noticed and what I really, really dis dislike about our side of the argument is that we will erase the humanitarian crisis because we want to focus, and we should, but we can simultaneously do it, focus on America's hand, America's imperialism. But it's like, if it, it, it and I'll give you the best example. And then and then you don't have to stay on hold because I'm, I'm sure you're probably ready to go. But here's the best example. When Jill Stein finally caught up with the rest of us. I'm sorry, Jill, but you're a year late uh, on the pipelines. Right. The competing pipelines, the Russian pipeline and the Qatar pipeline, both uh, uh, designed to go through Syria. Assad said no to the one from that was U.S. backed from 2009, um, and they, uh, he actually co-signed with the one from Russia. I get it. I get it, right? It's, it's like, oh, this is the explanation. This is, this is how we understand what's happening in Syria. No. <laughs> one, why didn't you know about this a year and a half or two years ago, three years ago? Two, you know, why are you just now getting this information? And then two, why do we always reduce international relations down to American imperialism. And to do that, we do it by erasing a lot of things. We erase the people who rebelled. We even erase the fact that they have the right to do that, right? Yeah. Shit, well, here we go. All right, I'm gonna finish this out because I wanna talk about other stuff. I'm tired of talking about Syria, not for real. We, I have seen, I have seen people who are opposed to the uh, to the Saudi or to Saudi Arabia's activity and war in Yemen, at the invitation of the Yemeni government to suppress the Houthi rebels, I've seen people who oppose that 
regime, that government, that invited government in, turn around and use the fact that Russia has been invited in as a justification for what's happening in Syria. In other words, I've seen people say, oh, well, Syria, you know, Russia is there by permission, so they're there legally. Flip the conversation and let's go a little further south. And they say, oh, well, you know, what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen is an atrocity. Yeah, but the Yemeni government invited Saudi Arabia there to participate in their quote unquote civil war. So it's like, are you going to at least be consistent with your argument? Because once you once you are inconsistent with your argument, it, you're erasing things to fit your argument. So if you if 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 you're OK, if you're OK with intervention because a government invited you there, then why are you not OK with the intervention that's happening in Yemen? I'm not OK with either one of them. That's the first thing we raise. Then we erase the fact that they have that people have the right to rebel. Right. Here in the United States, progressives, leftists, Marxists, socialists, all of us are waiting for the overthrow of capitalism so that we can take over for socialism. But then we're going to say that the people of Syria who wanted pro-democracy had no legal right to rebel? What the entire hell? What? It doesn't work like that. You can't. <laughs> Are you reserving the right to rebel to be only if it's rebelling against America? So you erase, you, you erase the, you, you switch your argument. And I'm not, I don't know who the you is. I'm just saying you in general, they, let me say they, right? So it's no, not so personal. They, they switch their argument and say that, oh, it's, it's fine for Russia to be there because Russia was invited, but it's horrible that Saudi Arabia is in Yemen, even though y Yemen, the Yemeni government invited Saudi Arabia there. Then two, they erase the very essence of rebellion against a brutal dictatorial regime. And they erase it by changing history, Nick. <laughs> but anyway, I leave Nick alone because he's not here to argue in his very effective way. Nick is a brilliant, uh, debater and has really great arguments. I'll leave Nick alone. Nick, we come on and discuss this a little more because he's not the only one. I've seen this argument so many places that that we erase the, the reality that Assad is a piece of shit. Let's 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 not let's not erase that. Do not. Oh, my God. Do not make heroes out of villains just because they are the opposite side of the American empire, which you so vehemently oppose. Sometimes somebody tweeted me, sometimes the enemy of your enemy is a piece of shit. Assad is that. So all of this, all these ruminations to try to make Assad to be okay, if for no other reason that he's the legal authority, then what about the legal authority in the United States? What about the legal authority of the of the of the structure of the infrastructure of the institutions to rule America? The very institutions that we oppose on so many levels. Some of you oppose a lot more than I do, but I oppose them as well. If you are planning and hoping for a proletariat revolt here in the United States, how in the hell are you going to erase the Syrian people's right to revolt over there just because their uh, revolution over there has fingerprints of American imperialism? Which goes to the other thing. I'm just I'm knee deep in it. So whatever. Let me just go all the way and get get it all out. Do you. Again, the enemy of your enemy is sometimes your enemy. They are not your friend. And if the if the purpose of opposition towards the rebellion in Syria is because we are trying to make sure that American imperialism doesn't do what it always does, which is get involved and mess things up. Right. For the purposes of spreading its empire. If that's the purpose, then how do you come to terms with the fact that Russia is just as capitalistic, just as imperialistic and just as oligarchical as America. Is, is, is Russia's 
and, 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 okay, let me actually, let me finish. Let me make the logical connections here, right? The logical connections here, because I want to make sure you're clear. I'm not saying that if you are against intervention that you're pro-Russia. No, I don't make simple arguments like that. I never have, and I never will. What I'm saying is if your opposition to intervention is to oppose American imperialism, then how do you stand? How do you how do you explain? You don't have to. But my question to you would be, how do you explain Russia's intervention for their expansion of their empire, of their capitalistic system? Because they are capitalistic and they are very imperialistic. They have a rich here is history of empire. Very deep. Anyway, let me stop being extra so I'm, I'm like which so you erase that and then you have to erase now all of this is in the context let me pause all of this is in the context of this simple fact i think america should not i think the only reason anyone should intervene is because of the humanitarian crisis that does exist now whether it's intervention from america or whether it's intervention from somebody you approve of, there is, and don't, I, 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 might, I might get violent <laughs> and slap somebody if you try to tell me that there is no humanitarian crisis. In fact, you will notice that I would not talk about Syria until I saw what I believe to be a humanitarian crisis that posed a philosophical problem for me. And this entire last month has been about you coming along with this philosophical uh, this, this problem. Because there is a problem, right? We don't want intervention. We don't. We don't want a no-fly zone. But at least be truthful and say that if you don't want intervention and you don't want a no-fly zone, that in my opinion, uh, saying that we're going to stop selling American arms over there, that's not going to stop it. That's not going to stop it. But, but if we do, let's go all the way with the Green Party argument. If we do stop selling arms and let's say we got an embargo and there are no arms going there to back the rebels, at least be willing to admit that you are turning over people who revolted and, caught and started a revolution to a man who has power, but not power ordained by the people. At least admit that doesn't mean that you're pro Russia. It doesn't mean it just means that you are more comfortable with a side being in control than you are with American interventionism. And I don't think that's a hard thing to say. I just think it's very disingenuous when people don't say that you are more comfortable because that's the inevitable outgrowth of your argument is that a side will remain. You are more comfortable with a man who used chemical weapons on his people, a man who killed hundreds of thousands of his own people. Well, you know, he let's just split in half. Let's just say he killed half, you know, so 125,000 of his own people. You're you're OK with him having power and maintaining control over the very people he oppressed. than you are with American interventionism. And somebody could really make the logical argument for that. Make that argument. But don't avoid don't avoid embrace embrace the bad parts of your idea because there are bad parts of every idea. I don't know if there's anything else to say about that other than the fact that to thine own self be true. To thine own self be true, man. Don't adjust, don't say something is okay in situation X and say it's not okay in situation Y. Don't erase, don't reduce everything to being about America. Yes, America is, is grimy. And then there's one level of argument that actually when I talk about the political dead tonight, I can talk about that. All right. Um, but because of time, I'm, and I'm tired of talking about, of, oh, no, I'm not. I'm lying. Let me stop lying. I'm not tired of talking about Syria because I like talking about Syria because it forces us to confront our arguments and see how far we're willing to go with the natural conclusion of our arguments. And I, I think it presents a wonderful dilemma for progressives internationally. It, it presents because our, our solutions are not as clean and simple as we reduce them to being. The solution in Syria, I'm sorry, Jill Stein, is not as simple as stop uh, as an embargo on arms because you cannot you cannot institute an embargo on arms without another level of intervention. And if your purpose is to stop intervention 
an expansion of American uh, empire, blah, 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 blah.